So I just got done watching episode 2 of season 6, and I've got to say, wow, what an episode. See, that was the true season 6 premiere. Last week's episode was crap compared to what we got here. I said this in my episode 1 Q&A, and I'll say it here. Season 6, episode 1 felt more like DLC add-on content to season 5. It did not feel like a premiere at all. I go as far as to say that last week's episode was deleted scenes from season 5 rather than a full-blown premiere, but this episode... Oh man, this is the true premiere to Season 6. Not only did it start off amazingly with some nice visions from Bran, but it ended with a full-blown resurrection of Jon Snow. This is what we've all been waiting for, and it did not disappoint. We got no Danny, Dorn, or those other people this time around, which is fine. I'm actually kind of happy we were able to kickstart things so early by bringing back some old characters and moving along the story in other areas. Before we begin with the video, I will say this right now. While I did really enjoy the episode, I would go as far as to say it's definitely one of my top 5 for the entire series so far. I did have a few nitpicky problems with it. Nothing too severe, but some things I would have done differently. If you're someone who has a problem with that kind of critique, please back out now. Fair warning. With that out of the way, let's get on to it. First, let's start with Bran and his vision of Winterfell many years ago. Obviously, he's grown a lot since we last saw him, and it's almost a different person. I didn't know the cave of the Three-Eyed Raven had a barber shop to keep his hair and beard nice and shaved. All it needs is a Starbucks and a Hooters, and you'd have a real problem getting him the fuck out. I will say this. I did enjoy the vision of them as kids with Ned and Benjen sparring. I was expecting young Ned and maybe even young Hodor, but Lyanna Stark? Oh my god, was not expecting that. Right off the bat, I got an Arya vibe when she showed up, and I wondered if the older guy talking to Ned was his brother Brandon. It would be cool to have all the wolf pups in one setting, and I really wish they could have confirmed that they were all there, but for now, let's assume that it is Ned's older brother. The other thing I did like was the reintroduction of Old Nan, who is Hodor's grandmother. The actress in season 1 passed away before the show began to air, and the showrunners decided to retire her character off screen out of respect for the actress. It is presumed Odan passed away between seasons 1 and 2, but the reason I bring her up is because there's a theory going around that Old Nan had a relationship with Sir Duncan the Tall, and that he is the reason why Hodor is such a big guy. Sir Duncan is a character in George Martin's side series, A Tale of Duncan Egg. It's set several decades before season one and is a pretty interesting read for those who want a st story setting in the same universe but from a different perspective. Another thing I liked was how Bran wanted to stay there because of how happy and simple everything was. Warging has kind of become like a drug to him, like, almost like a place he can escape to, but with every drug comes a harsh consequence of too much use. I like how the Raven likened it to the sea and if he stays too long he'll drown. I thought that was great, but some have pointed out some flaws with the scene, mainly the raven and how he's situated in the tree. In the books, the tree has pretty much grown around and through parts of his body to where he's pretty much become a part of it, whereas here he's just laying there with no problems. Personally, I didn't have too much of an issue with it, but I was wondering why the sudden change with the children of the forest and their appearance. This show has a real problem with inconsistencies regarding characters. The children in season 4 looked way better in my opinion and more childlike, whereas here they look like an awkward Pokemon. No idea why they changed it, but if you don't know why, feel free to let me know down below. But the brand stuff overall I did enjoy, and, I, and that is something I can safely say after years of finding his scenes just completely boring. But like I said, I did enjoy what we got here, and I think episode 1 should have opened up with Bran and this vision, but what are you gonna do? Let's move on to everybody's favorite psycho, Ramsay. So Roos and Ramsay discuss the situation with Sansa's escape, and eventually we learn that Walda has given birth to a boy. Ramsay then hugs his father, stabs him, and then feeds Walda and her baby to the dogs in a nice medieval combo meal. I loved every bit of the Bolton scenes this episode, and it served to prove that just when you think you hate Ramsay, he gives you reason to hate him just a little bit more. I did like the discussions between them about killing Jon and how the other northern lords would never back them again, but Ramsay doesn't care. I also hope we see more of this secondary character, the Karstark Lord, who is still salty after Rob beheaded his father. Now, even though I loved every bit of what we got with Ramsay and how all that played out, I have one minor complaint. I saw it coming a mile away when they gave us that angle shot of Ramsay's back with a dagger on his lower back. Now, before people go off, let me explain. Yes, we knew Roose Bolton would die eventually and that it might have been Ramsay who did the killing, but we didn't know how it would happen. It's been foreshadowed to death with Roose telling Ramsay every second, it's gonna be a boy and you're fucked, ha 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 
he, he might as well have announced it to the world how fucked Ramsey was. So we knew it was inevitable, but they made it painstakingly clear that Ramsey was going to do it right that second with that shot of Ramsey's back going in for the hug. Whoever made that decision to film the actor's back with a dagger clearly strapped to his lower back made a rookie mistake. The reason we like this show is because this shit happens when we least expect it, but anybody with eyes caught that and you knew exactly what was going to happen and that kind of bothered me. The moment I saw it, I knew Ramsey was going to go for the killing strike. Now let me explain to you why it was a bad idea to show it and film it from that position. Ramsey is not a hugging guy. I'd expect him to throw dead cats at you to show his affection rather than hug you. So what they could have done was instead of showing us the dagger on his back, have him go in for the hug, which would confuse the audience, but then give us hope that he is kind of a nice guy when it comes to family situations, then take out a weapon from his father's waist or a blunt object on the table and use it to kill his dad. It would have blindsided us, the audience, right when we thought Ramsey was being genuine with that show of affection. With that aside, I did like the Bolton scenes. I thought Ian Rion was exceptional this episode, especially towards the end where he says, I am Lord Bolton. You can just hear the cruelty in his voice. I loved it. I heard that he originally auditioned for the role of Jon Snow, but I'm sorry man, you're Ramsay to the core. Oh, and side note, Ian Rion is playing a young version of Hitler in an upcoming movie. That's not a joke, he really is. Throwing that out there for anybody who cares. Let's move on to Sansa, which... Didn't get much scream time, but it did serve a purpose. Theon wants to head back to the Iron Islands. I was a little surprised when I heard her mention that Theon should take the black. Might as well, but I doubt that would ever go down as easily as it could. He says that he will be going home, but I really doubt that Theon will ever make it to the Iron Islands. I mean, something tells me that they will eventually catch up with him, and he'll be one of the two people that Ramsay kills towards the end of the season. What I would like to happen is for Theon to come back and shake things up on the Iron Islands and hopefully rally some of the Ironborn against the Boltons. Wishful thinking on my part, but to the point. I'm starting to like the relationship between Theon and Sansa here. He loves her. Not romantically, I think, but it's the kind of love you have for someone who's gone through the same troubles you have and you both want to overcome it together. He's redeemed himself by saving her and I will, I will say it's kind of a shame that he isn't leaving, mainly because I, I kind of wanted to see him being more protective of her, and in turn, she could have helped him regain some of his confidence back. But overall, good stuff with Sansa, and yes, I did notice that Brienne didn't tell her that Arya is with the Hound for some reason. I don't know why that wouldn't come up in a conversation, but whatever. Moving on to King's Landing, where we have some guy telling his version of the Walk of Shame event. He goes off to take a piss, and the mountain comes out of nowhere and smashes his head against the wall. I gotta say, I love how the zombie mountain is just so badass, in the sense that he just doesn't give a fuck. I mean, he kills that one guy and doesn't even bother to wipe the blood off his glove, and you know before his zombification that he was a monster in terms of how strong he was, but now he's a monster in every sense of the word. Originally, they called him Tywin Lannister's Mad Dog because his house sigil were three hounds, and also because when Tywin pointed at something, he attacked. I like how now he's become Cersei's mad dog and just kills people for talking crap about her. He comes back to Cersei and she wants to attend her daughter's funeral, but can't because Tommen has ordered the Lannister soldiers to keep her inside. For those of you confused by that, it's quite simple. Regardless of whose house you follow, you do as the king's command first above all else. Eventually we get a scene with Tommen and Jaime and I'm wondering if Jaime will ever reveal to Tommen the big secret that Marcella figured out. I'll leave this for the comment section to debate over if Tommen would actually accept Jamie as his dad and be cool with it, or if Tommen would freak out and be all depressed about it. Eventually, the High Sparrow comes in, played by the amazing Jonathan Price, and there's a nice bit of tension going on between him and Jamie, which I liked a lot. If this was season one and Jamie still had his right hand, he would have massacred everybody in there like he was Zoro or something. What I never understood is why can't they just give him like a short sword version of a hand, like a blade attached to an iron plate hand so he can just slip it on and beat people up with it. I mean, if you've ever seen one of those sword fighting movies, the sensei always tells the student that he must act like the sword is an extension of his body. Okay, so if you give Jamie a dagger hand or whatever, it literally becomes a part of his body. I don't get why they don't just do that, but I assume Jamie is just so overpowered with one that he'd conveniently kill everyone and ruin the tension and drama that we need to continue the show. That sucks because if someone paraded my sister wife around naked and shamed her for being a slut, I'd kill a sparrow or ten. And afterwards I'd seek therapy because oh my god. 
And the whole scene with Tommen and Cersei, I was on the fence over. It was a nice scene, but it's something that could have been done last week and not this week. I really want to see Cersei start going to town on everybody with her mad dog, but I guess I can wait till next episode. But I will say it's probably a good idea that Tommen didn't allow her to attend the funeral. We all know too well what happens when Jaime and Cersei are in front of dead children. Oh my god, these people are insane. M moving on! So, in Marine, the situations with the Harpies have got worse, and we find out that the other slave cities of Astapor and Yunkai have gotten silent. We all know that eventually when communications stop altogether, soon comes the March of War. We also learn that Danny's dragons have stopped eating since her disappearance, and I like that. Not that the creatures are starving, of course, but that they're making the dragons act like actual animals. They get depressed, they miss their mom, and they aren't rabid animals that attack for no reason. I like this because, in a way, it gives them personality and it puts more of a focus on them not being mindless monsters. Tyrion eventually goes down there and removes their chains. People think that because of this, that he may be some kind of Targaryen, and while that may be possible, Maybe he's just not an asshole, and they can sense that. It's like Masande said, they never attacked her because they could tell a difference between friend and foe. Not only that, but Tyrion has read up on dragons in his youth, and he knows much about them. I don't think this means he's a Targaryen, but he just knows how to talk to and handle animals, not just people. It adds to his character, and I'm sure everybody would be going crazy over this, but I don't think there is much to it than him just being a nice guy. But the stuff in Marine was great, and I do hope we get some more funny banter between Tyrion and Varys, which was excellent this episode. Now, I won't stay too long on the Arya scenes, because I didn't have much of an opinion about it this time around. I'm glad they aren't dragging her punishment out for the entire season, and are moving on with her training, but in this episode, there wasn't much meat on the bones for me to really invest in. I'm glad we're getting on with her faceless men training, instead of her being a beggar for half the season, which is great. In the book, she stays there for a little longer, of course, but hopefully... In the show, being a beggar has taught her to use her other senses a bit more, but I'm wondering if they'll ever give her some warging powers at all to help her combat the blindness. We'll have to see. Next we have the Greyjoys, and I was absolutely hyped for this all year, and I've got to say, this was awesome. I like what we saw so far, but I am worried that they'll be treating the Greyjoys like House Martell last season and not giving them enough screen time or stuff to do. I'm glad that Yara and Balon are back, and I did like the scene between them. It illustrates the strengths and weaknesses of the culture of people who really don't excel in the traditional sense of warfare, like taking castles and fighting big armies. The Ironborns are Vikings. They're pirates. They come in, they beat you up, and they take your stuff and leave before reinforcements arrive. On sea, they're nearly impossible to beat, but on land, they're crippled. Yara gets on her father's case about this, but he refuses to see reason. Eventually, he wanders outside, and we get Yoran Greyjoy, finally, at last. I know you guys have been hearing me complain about how much of a shame it is that we haven't gotten him yet. They delivered. Now, I'm sure some book readers will get pissed off at how they introduce him in the show, but I'm quite satisfied with it. I thought it was ominous and cool at the same time. My one complaint has nothing to do with the Greyjoy scenes, but with the showrunners and how late they were to introduce this plotline. I've said it before that Euron is probably the second biggest threat to Westeros and to Danny and her dragons. The first being the White Walkers, of course. They have said that after season 6, there is only 13 episodes left of material that they can adapt, and I just feel like it's a little too late for him to be coming in, but I am glad they're finally getting to it. I just hope they don't skip over the good stuff and not include him in the next couple of episodes. In season 5, we barely got any Martell scenes, and they were oddly spaced out. I really hope they give him more screen time and things to do, and show us how much of a badass he is. But overall, I enjoyed it. Good stuff. And finally, we come to Castle Black, and I have no words for these scenes other than fucking awesome. We have the traitors trying to break down the door to get inside to kill the loyalists. Alistair Thorne, hashtag make the wall great again, is leading them, and before they're able to break through, we get one one busting through the gates. The Night's Watch quickly throw down their weapons, and the Wildlings take some prisoners. I really like the whole scene with one one taking that guy and smashing him against the wall. Yeah, if I saw that, I'd surrender too. I love Thorne when he turns to Ed and he says, You fucking traitor. British people, I'm sorry, but I love Alistair Thorne. He really should be your president. Hashtag, make the wall great again. Tormund comes in and sees the body, and I love how he comments about the amount of stab wounds. Almost like Jon is so badass, one or two knives couldn't kill him. It'd take like 20, because he's so awesome. Eventually, Davos goes to see Melisandre, and you can tell that her faith is a little shaken by recent events. Normally, we're used to Mel being all confident in her abilities, 
And this is really the first time we've seen her all sad and, and depressed. It's almost like a puppy dog face. But I do want to call your attention to how amazing Davos was in this episode. Originally, he never trusted her or her religion and didn't make much of a deal about it. Then in Season 3, he goes to full-on wanting to kill her, and now he's putting his faith in her and, in a way, restoring her own. Like my buddy Bane said, it's almost coming around full circle that Davos hated her and that religion, but now relies on it just when she's given up. If I had one complaint about these scenes, it would be a very minor one. I would have liked that when Mel was resurrecting Jon for the table to kind of levitate a little, or maybe for her necklace to glow just a bit. But she says her words and everybody leaves the room, and then Ghost can sense him coming back, and just then, he wakes up and the episode ends. I will say this, I kind of wish that they didn't bring him back too early in the season, but at the same time, I'm glad they aren't dragging it out. By not bringing him back within the first few episodes, the audience gets a sense of, so is he never coming back? But I also understand they need to get him back in the game to kick some ass, so I'm okay with it. But overall, this episode was fantastic. I absolutely loved it, and to me, this is the season 6 premiere. If I were in charge, I would have combined episodes 1 and 2 together, and have made it an hour and 40 minute premiere to kickstart the season. Last week's episode may have been good, but for Game of Thrones, that's not good enough. It has to be amazing, and it has to be excellent, and it has to be perfect, and this episode did that for me. If I had to give it a rating, I'd give it a 4.5 out of 5. The Arya stuff kind of bogged it down a little, and I wish there were more to it, but overall, I did like it. And if you remember last week, I said how every episode review, I would try to put the spotlight on someone in the community who I think deserves your attention. This week, we have Greg from Greece and his amazing one-of-a-kind statues. Here is his Knight's King's bust, and I think it looks awesome. If you're interested in checking out more of them and getting your hands on one, I'll leave a link in the description below to his Facebook page. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you're new to my channel, check out some of my other videos like my Secret Targaryen Theory or my other character history videos. Thanks again so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time. Baba Booey.